Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the stage, Douglas Brinkley, Margaret Macmillan, and John Meacham, with your moderator, Jeff Cowan. Well, I hope you're having as much fun as I am at this festival. You know, I always think of students in college, a few of you were in college a few years ago, as the best thing to do is to take the, the teacher, not the course. And here I think of the thing that's fun is to take these incredible authors and be in a room with them, whatever they're talking about. <laughs> the only problem with this uh, festival is that there's somebody in every room yeah. that you want to be with. But today we have terrific, three terrific people who, and I think you've heard from them all at one point or another, uh, Douglas Brinkley, who has uh, written biographies about more presidents than most of us have ever heard of, but also <laughs> done so many other interesting things, including among a gazillion things. Your next, your upcoming book is on the space program? Yeah, American Moonshot, John F. Kennedy and the Great Space Race. So wow. we'll be watching for yeah, that. Yeah. Be watching for that. And he's the CNN historian. And just to give you a backstage bit of gossip, he has a little of basement, um, basement studio, uh, uh, basement studio envy of John Meacham, <laughs> <laughs> who's got that at MSNBC, and Margaret Mellon's trying to make the same deal with the with the CBC. Uh, <laughs> of course, a great historian. 1919 is just one of those transformative books that's so important. Uh, and John Meacham, who's written so many wonderful, uh, uh, so many wonderful biographies, former editor of Newsweek, and uh, and, and many of us know him from his basement uh, uh, studio <laughs> um, from, from Morning Joe. The assignment today is really to talk about who is your favorite uh, historical figure. Uh, I think I want to make that a free and fun thing so people can talk about one or two and why, and then maybe later we'll get into some other elements of thinking about and writing about people that you love. But um, John, why don't you start us off with, with your favorite historical figure? Well, the way, this, <clears throat> the way this question is often phrased is, who would you like to have dinner with? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And I used to say Jesus, but that didn't end very well. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided, no, don't, don't, don't want that. No. Um, so, um, so mine is, uh, and Margaret has a, has a familial connection here, mine is Winston Churchill. Um, a, I wouldn't have to say much. Yes. Uh, so that's yes. good. Um, there'd be a very good uh, set of cigars, which is very important to me. And um, he was able to, it was a genuine Renaissance man. Uh, he was an able, able writer, uh, hugely prolific. Uh, he was a good painter. Uh, just a, a man of parts, as I, Berlin, called him the largest human being of our time. Um, and my sense is, the, the, the lesson I take from him most of all is perseverance. Churchill got about one thing right. But if you're going to get one thing right, Adolf yeah. Hitler is the one to get right. <laughs> uh, and so if, if, if Churchill had died in 1938, even into 39, he would have gotten some notices in the New York Times, uh, an interesting British statesman, uh, who had, as we said earlier, he changed parties three times. He said anyone can rat, it takes character to re-rat. Uh, he was um, wrong about Gandhi, he was wrong about India, he was wrong about the gold standard, he was wrong about the Sydney uh, street riots. But by God, when the crisis of the time came, he was right about uh, World War II. And I think that it's, to my mind, inarguable uh, though we can argue, uh, but, but I'm, I'm convinced that we live in a better and brighter world because this man lived and rose to power when he did on the 10th of May, 1940. Uh, when he became prime minister, he later wrote that I felt as if I were walking with destiny and all my life had been but preparation for this hour and for this trial. I was sure I should not fail. No one else was sure he wouldn't fail. Uh, when Roosevelt learned about his being appointed because of the time difference, it was Friday afternoon in Washington, and FDR used to keep the cabinet in to work all week. And so depending on your point of view, that was good or bad. Uh, and so the cabinet meetings were on Friday afternoon, and he was handed a note saying that Churchill had been called to the palace to, become, to replace Chamberlain. And FDR read it, looked up and said, well, I suppose Winston is the best man England has 
even if he is drunk half the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. To which I quote our, our own great wartime commander in chief, Abraham Lincoln, that, that if, if that's what it takes, I hope they send a case of whiskey to all our prime ministers. <laughs> <laughs> John, is there a particular book, of course he, you know, wrote his own wonderful book, you know, and there have been many biographies, but is there one that for people who want to follow you here, you'd say, this is the one to read? Well, there are, th one of the reasons he, he, he looms so large for me is I read William Manchester's yeah. book, yeah. Uh, the first yeah. volume, The Last Lion, when I was of an age, I was highly impressionable. Uh, I actually read, um, I think I was in early high school days, and one summer I read the, the first volume of The Last Lion, and my friend, future friend Evan Thomas and Walter Isaacson's book, The Wise Men. Mm. And I loved them both so much that I then reread both sequentially. And 10 years later or so, I was in a job interview with Evan uh, for Newsweek at the time, and I said, yeah, I just want to tell you, I read your book when I was 13 years old, and then reread it. And it was just a, such a great summer. And Evan looked at me and said, he must have been a real loser. <laughs> 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 Which was fair enough. You know? uh, so I, I, think that the, I think the first volume of The Last Lion uh, is also a wonderful portrait of Churchill's world, uh, the, of the great Victorian summer. The other book of Churchill's that not enough people read uh, is called My Early Life. Mm. Uh, which I think is his best book. Uh, it's a memoir. It was published uh, in 34 or 35, I think. Uh, another book of his that if you haven't seen is, is worth playing with, is uh, dipping in and out of, is called Great Contemporaries, uh, where he did portraits of uh, various statesmen and writers he knew. Thanks. And Margaret, what are one or two favorites? Um, favorites rather than heroes, because I always think heroes are a bit dangerous because you tend to assume they're better than everyone else and, and more uh, heroic. And there's the risk, by the way, if you write about them, that you find that they have some flaws that you didn't expect yeah. to find. Yes, and, and you know, the, the, the lovely thing about discovering people in the past is, is, is discovering how human they are. And they're not like us, but they are in some very important ways. And so one of the people I am absolutely fascinated by and, and love is someone that I suspect most people won't know much about, and that is someone called Babur, who founded the Mughal dynasty in India in the 16th century, a dynasty that lasted until the 19th century. He came from a very small kingdom in Central Asia, and when he was about 12, his father, who was very fat, was out feeding his pigeons in a dovecot on the side of the castle, and the dovecot simply broke away and fell into the ravine, carrying the father with it. So little Babur became prince of this little kingdom, and his loving family, his dear uncles, arrived and promptly took it away from him. And so he became an exile and got fed up and thought at one point of throwing it all in, giving up any attempt to have a kingdom and moving to China. And we know this because he kept a journal. And this is what's so extraordinary because the fact that he was literate was extraordinary. In those days, most people of his type wouldn't have been literate at all. And he kept this very personal journal and he talks about his life and he talks about wanting a kingdom and getting fed up and falling in love and then he discovers alcohol. I'm um, a good Muslim, but he loved drinking and he loved um, taking drugs. And he sounds like a fraternity boy. He said, you know, I got so drunk last night, they tell me they don't know how I got home. <laughs> and I got on my horse and they said that I just rode like a maniac. And so you get this extraordinary personal voice, which I loved. I mean, it's just, you go across the centuries and he's not like us. I mean, he will be talking. You realize this every so often, you're brought up short. You think, what a nice man. And then he, he talks, he loved gardens. And so wherever he went, he, he would build a garden. He conquered Kabul, and then he conquered Herat, and he built beautiful gardens there, and then he conquered Delhi. And he didn't like the climate, but he said, I'll do my best to build a garden. And so he will be talking about his gardens and saying how beautiful they are. I sat on the terrace looking at them. And then he says in the next breath, I found out my cook was trying to poison me, so I sent her and a few others to be trampled by elephants. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this wonderful contrast. But... I recommend it. it. It reaches across the centuries, and there's a wonderful in English translation done, I think, by someone at the Smithsonian. It's just fascinating. It suddenly reminds you that there are a great many human beings in the past. And the other person, if, if you should have... So it me, Jamie, something yeah. we should do is post these favorites somehow online so that yeah. our readers know where to find where these. To find, well, the, I can tell you what the, where the book is. I'm not sure I would like to have had dinner with him because I think I would have had to drink a lot, and he might have <laughs> sent me to be trampled by <laughs> elephants. Um, <laughs> 
But the other person I would love to have had dinner with, and it is a hero of, of mine, I suppose, is Michel de Montaigne, the French essayist who lived during the Wars of Revolution in France and was the most civilized and humane person coming out of that dreadful century when Catholics were killing Protestants and vice versa. And he writes these wonderful essays, and he is interested in literally everything. And he can never keep his mind on any one subject at any time. And so he starts off, one of his famous essays is called On Carriages, and he starts writing about different kinds of carriages. And then he said, have you noticed how very odd it is that some people smell differently to other people? Mm. And he wanders off into that. And then he wanders off into flowers. And then he, every so often he says, I must get back to my subject. So he gets back for about two lines. And then he wanders off into something else. But he's enormously civilized. And it's a time when the new world is being explored and discovered. And he keeps on saying, you know, we tell them. We keep telling those people over there, the, the people who live there, we're bringing them civilization. He said, I'm not sure we're bringing them anything of the sort. You know, he has this wonderful openness and willingness to question. So between the two of them, Babur and Michel de Montaigne, I, th I think I would like to meet them at some point. And before we turn to Doug, you had been talking a little bit backstage also about the difference between the way these issues are seen by historians versus biographers. Could you talk about that for just a minute so that we're all educated? Yeah, there's a slight <coughs> cold war sometimes between historians and biographers, and we both, I think, tend to look down on the other. Historians say, oh, well, biographers, yes, they go on and on about the people, and they go on and about their feelings, but they don't understand the times and the context. And biographers say about historians, they are so unimaginative, yeah. and all they do is talk about the great historical currents, and they don't understand the living, breathing, suffering human beings at the middle of it. I think we need to talk to each other, and I think we do both. I think good biographers situate their people in their times, and good historians understand the peoples who are part of those times. So I wish we didn't have a, that. We do have a Cold War a bit, I think. Yes, yeah. Doug, you're kind of we're in the middle of that Cold War anyway, yeah. and both in both sides of that particular uh, uh, divide, but who, who, who are some people you'd, you'd love to write about or re read more about or have dinner with? Well, you know, I've been doing a lot of panels on presidents here, and um, so it would be easy for me to say uh, Theodore Roosevelt, who I usually say is my favorite president, Franklin Roosevelt. They are the, the, my stars in presidential history. I just adore reading about both and studying them, George Washington, is another one of my personal favorites, but I wanted to pick Rosa Parks um, mm. because I think I, I, the reason I pick Rosa Parks is I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and we lived there when Martin Luther King uh, was, you know, my childhood memories of Dr. King in Atlanta. I remember where I was. I was eight years old when Dr. King was killed. Mm. I subsequently bounced around, got my doctorate, and I taught history in New Orleans and I had a thing called the magic bus, and I would take college students around the country, yeah. and we'd visit history sites. Well, I then created, tailored one for civil rights tours. And we went to Montgomery and Birmingham, Selma, Atlanta, studying the civil rights movement. When I'd go to Montgomery in those days, um, it, there was no memorials for Rosa Parks. There was one street named after where Jefferson Davis Avenue intersected with Rosa Parks <laughs> Boulevard. <coughs> but, and so I would wanted to see where Rosa Parks lived on December 1, 1955, when the Montgomery bus boycott kicked in and she became the mother of the movement. It was the most decrepit, underfunded housing project she was living in, and in a room without exaggerating that her home was the size of this stage. I mean, and, it, and she lived in it with her husband Raymond in this impoverished way, yet her integrity level was so high. Uh, she didn't go to college, but she went to an industrial school for girls where they taught home economics in those days. It was one of the Booker T. Washington industrial schools in the South. And then she uh, worked her way as, uh, um, was, would do things like um, work as a secretary for the NAACP for no money. Uh, E.D. Nixon, who was the big kingpin of the railroads um, and the, um, the porters union, you know, she would file all those things and keep it all. But I couldn't believe that with the famous Rosa Parks, there was no, nobody had written a serious book about her. There's Taylor Branch's Three Bomb. I'm not kidding you, 200 books on Dr. King. 200, nothing on Rosa Parks. So I decided I was going to write a biography of Rosa Parks. And I reached out, because Mrs. Parks was still alive, and Elaine Steele, her person who worked for Mrs. Parks, said, we'd like it to be an African-American woman 
was her biographer. Well, I'm not that. <laughs> and I brought, and John would appreciate I brought like three of my books to her and, you know, to get my credentials to interview Mrs. Parks and all this. And that night I was walking back to the Cosmos Club in D.C. where I was staying and Elaine Steele called me and said, I didn't like hearing myself tell you that. Um, you're a good historian. You write a lot. There's nothing wrong with you. So we're going to, uh, I'm going to have you spend time with Mrs. Parks. I was like, <laughs> um, I started going with her. I went with her when she got her Congressional Gold Medal in Capitol Hill with her wheelchair. I would stay with her on 8th Street and DuPont Circle a home in Washington. I went with her out to Beverly Hills where she spent time. I went to Detroit where she was a microscopic on the history of the Underground Railroads. Her apartment overlooked the Detroit River and her apartment was on the exact spot where John Brown had met Frederick Douglass. Um, and I would spend time with her and I would find old Montgomery new advertiser newspapers and show her the newspapers because she would say, oh my God, that orange soda, we used to drink it. And mm. Because she had had a frame of mind only to say the same thing when I read transcripts about December 1, 55. Turned out to be an amazing woman. Um, and during World War II, she um, tried to um, get African-American kids to go into libraries and they wouldn't let them, African Americans in Montgomery, even get a book in the public library. She sued Alabama for the right to vote. She did the field reports on women that were raped in Alabama by white men, and it was covered up in her day. I started realizing this demure, very Christian woman, everything about her was the African Methodist Episcopalian Church. Yet later in life, she went to Japan and, and adopted Buddhism hmm. with her Christianity. So it was... And she, and she was, she used to tell me that I'm mixed race. Everybody says I'm African American, I'm Scottish, Irish, Cherokee, Creek, you know, and she, and she would row them all off. So um, getting an opportunity to write about her, and I started doing the book when I turned it into Viking, my publisher, I got back, well, what's, you, you know, you're the biographer, what's her dark side? It's like, there isn't one to run support <laughs> on it. She, well, there, you know, she, uh, she would take care of it. The reason Montgomery Rose is because she would do after-school programs and teach people and always dressed to the nines, never swore. And the only agreement I met with Ms., made with Mrs. Parks was that I'd let her read my book before publication when the final galley was done, just for error but no editorial comment. And she called me. Uh, she called my wife when our kids were born and things. But she called me and said, I have one change you must make. Uh, I was like, uh-oh. What did I? And she said, you call my husband Raymond an alcoholic. And he was a heavy drinker. Uh -oh. But not an alcoholic. Uh -oh. It was generational. She didn't yeah. like that term. Yeah. I wrote very well, I felt, about Raymond in, in, in my book. And, um, and so, you know... It, it was one of those things when you get to know somebody in history, there are disadvantages of writing about a living person as a biographer because you might feel you're co-opted, you don't want to hurt them. But in other cases, this experience for me uplifted my life. I have three kids that are from 11, you know, I have 11, 13, 14-year-old. They all study Rosa Parks in school, and I get to go to their schools and tell them that you too can make a difference. Mm. Stand up with you believe in, stand up against injustice, that great people can be everyday people. Mm. And uh, I think it's important for us to remember that it doesn't have to be presidents and world leaders that are the greats. It can be us. It can be you. And Mrs. Parks is a great vehicle for that lesson. That's it. a great story, Doug. I love it. Uh, you know, as I think about the impact on young people, which is so important for all of historians, uh, one of the ways they learn is also through, whether it's through fiction or through movies. Uh, there was another panel where people talked about how things are somehow badly distorted, but sometimes they're true. Mm. Uh, <coughs> hidden figures, for example. Uh, I don't know just how accurate it was, but it certainly was an inspiring story that none of us knew. I is there anything like that that any of you think of where there's a figure that you think has been wonderfully displayed who you think that sort of brought that person to life for a world that otherwise wouldn't have known them and, and, and it's inspiring too. Well, there's very much an example right now, <coughs> which is Catherine Graham in The Post. Yeah. Um, and uh, Was she still, uh, when you were the editor of Newsweek, was I worked still? for Mrs. Graham. Yeah. 
That, saying that is like you know, when Lyndon Johnson was in Vietnam and there were a bunch of helicopters on the tarmac and he took a left and the GI said, oh no, Mr. President, that's not your helicopter. He said, son, they're all my helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we all worked for Mrs. Graham. Um, the other great Mrs. Graham story about that is uh, one, uh, the Newsweek used to, we closed it on Saturday nights and it appeared Sunday, Sunday nights, you know, usually in Washington. And, uh, we had an item in the front of the magazine about a sitting senator, not here, uh, that um, was just woefully wrong. And the senator had called Mrs. Graham uh, on Monday morning and let her know that he was not wildly pleased with this. And uh, Evan Thomas, whom I mentioned a minute ago, uh, I happened to be in his office. He was the Washington bureau chief uh, that, that morning. And Mrs. Graham got the call from the senator she hung up the phone and called Evan, and I could hear her voice on the phone. Uh, now I think of it as Meryl Streep's, but you know that. that, that. <laughs> and Evan, Evan, charmingly but ineffectively, uh, quoted Phil Graham, uh, who had said, uh, she, he said, um, "Well, ma'am, I'm sorry, but you know, as your husband said, it's just supposed to be the first rough draft of history." And in that wonderful Mrs. Graham voice, I heard through the phone, but does it have to be so fucking rough? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I think they captured her. Uh, I, th I think, I, you know, several of us here knew her, and I think she would have been beyond thrilled by having Meryl Streep. I mean, Rose Styron, who's here and knows Meryl Streep well and knew Kay well, I think knows just how, how much she would have loved that portrait. Yeah, well, and somebody did a piece, which was quite good recently, about you know, she was cut out of All the President's Men. She's not in that movie. Amazing. And this is kind of a, 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 a needed uh, correction of the record. Yeah. Margaret, is there somebody who you think of that sort of got a wonderful historical portrait in, in whether it's a, a, a novel or in a, in a movie? Well, I think, yes, I mean, there's some wonderful portraits. I'm, I'm always worried when movies try and do historical figures and, and decide that the historical figure isn't interesting enough and tries to update them more. I mean, I, you know, I was saying to someone the other day, some of you may have seen the old Robin Hood with Kevin Costner, and Kevin Costner comes over as a deeply sensitive, caring, feminist man, <laughs> um, which is unconvincing, um, <laughs> given the times. And Maid Marian is a sort of you know, fe proto-feminist who insists on women having an equal share in what's going on in the woods around Nottingham. So I'm a bit worried when, when, when we try and recover people and, and tinker with them to make them up to date. But one of the really good things I think that's been happening in history is we've been, and I guess we're always doing it, finding people we'd forgotten about mm. or never knew about. And one of the very great things I think about women's history, for example, which used not to even be a subject when I was at university and now is that we've, through that, found women who should have been celebrated but weren't. Uh, the women code breakers at Bletchley the black American women who worked, was it at NASA? Yeah. Who, whose re whose contributions simply were not recognized. And I think that's one of the useful things history can do. It can uncover lost heroes and heroines or, or lost people who really made a difference that we just, for some reason, they weren't paid attention to at the time because of who they were. They weren't important enough or they were the wrong gender or they came from the wrong social class. And I think that's something that we're, we're doing a lot of. And I, I do think, I mean, there's some wonderful, wonderful biographies being written. Um, you know, and, and what Hilary Mantel has done with Wolf Hall has, has given a whole generation of people an understanding of, of Tudor England and of this very complicated and very difficult, and I think in the end, utterly ruthless man, Thomas Cromwell. Mm -hmm. But anything that awakens an interest, and I think she has, unlike a lot of perhaps some historical novelists and filmmakers, she's kept very, very much to the historical record. She's used it, and she's imagined it beyond it, but she's kept to the record, I think. Sorry? Uh, well, you know, I think the book's almost always better than the movie. Uh, mm -hmm. I will say with uh, William Styron's Sophie's Choice, the book and the movie were both tremendous. No. And I thought also with, you know, something like Kill a Mockingbird of Harper Lee and the movie yeah. are both tremendous. It does happen, and that, yeah. that's a a very happy moment. The right stuff with Tom Wolfe, I thought the movie was good, and the book, you know, both. Um, but I, we're talking about hidden figures in history, and I, I think we all would share this. When you're working on a book, you do discover undersung yeah. figures. Mm -hmm. You're working on the big person, Theodore Roosevelt, and then you realize, wow, 
the person I should be writing about is, you know, Gifford Pinchot. Right. If I'm writing on TR and conservation, what Pinchot is doing <coughs> with forestry, he's the name everybody should know. Uh, I recently found that trying to build up a, the woman figure of Rachel Carson, Silent Spring. Oh, yeah. But I found that the undersung person was Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas, who was feeding Rachel Carson documentation mm -hmm. on DDT yeah. and all yeah. of this stuff from the Supreme Court, yeah. you know, and you're like, yeah. wow, you've got to add. Wait, so we all, I think many of us knew that he was an environmentalist. But how was he getting this information and feeding it to? What's that because story? Because he was a member of the Wilderness Society, which was created in 1935 for wilder, uh, roadless wilderness. And he started going all over the country and writing these two books called My Wilderness, right. essay after essay on them. And then he would, everybody would come through him. He became a, the leading stopgap environmental figure. So yesterday I got in a debate with Karl Rove about the Arctic Refuge in Alaska, yeah. but it was Douglas <coughs> went camping in the artist's refuge yeah. as Supreme Court Justice to come back and then to tell Eisenhower, they weren't friends at big time, Bill Douglas was Democrat, he told Ike, we gotta save this spot up here. He was doing those kinds of things yeah. behind the scenes, um, you know, all the time. Uh, but the person that I, I, I think that we have an obligation to once in a while, like Scott Berg told us in our, his wonderful introductory, uh, uh, talk about the Library of America volume on, you know, writing in World War I or a chance to give voices to others. In my life, I used to get, the book that influenced me as a boy growing up was Jack Kerouac's On the Road. Mm. And when I became part of the establishment, I would be at the Century Club in New York or something with Arthur Schlesinger Jr. became a mentor. They all, oh, Jack Kerouac, a bum. Oh, he's never going to be in the pantheon of greats. The whole Council on Foreign Relations people, including Jim Aho, what are you dabbling in Kerouac for? <laughs> it used to annoy me to no end because I knew On the Road was a special novel, and not just that, other Kerouac books, The Dharma Bums and uh, Visions of Cody and Big Sur. So I started a campaign to get him in the Library of America, and I did it. It's The Road Novels of Jack Kerouac. Oh, and we've got now two volumes of Kerouac in there with Whitman and with Cather and with Frederick Douglass because I thought he belonged in the American uh, pantheon. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, and I'd like to do that with Thomas Wolfe of North Carolina who's being, der der he's being derided all the time, but Wolfe's books can't go home again and all are yeah. out of fashion now, but Wolfe is still a very potent voice. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if, if each of you could talk for just a minute about who you'd like to write about now? Is there anybody, you're, I mean, I know you're writing about John, about James Madison right now. Is there, do you have a thought beyond that of somebody you'd like to, I'm particularly interested, if there's somebody you'd like to write about, but you know what, your publisher says nobody would care. Oh, no publisher would ever say that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a cynical California. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're in, we are in cynical California. Academic so. view. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you ivory tower people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, I don't have a person in my, there are any number of events that I think would be lovely. I have sort of a, a, a fantasy bucket list. Um, I'm fascinated by the six days between the attack on Pearl Harbor and Hitler's declaration of war on the United States. Hmm. Uh, FDR yeah. did not move against Germany until Germany moved against us uh, and on the 11th uh, of, of December. Longest five days of Winston Churchill's life, yeah. because he was suddenly terrified that uh, the Republicans who were pacifically oriented were going to keep FDR from fighting a European war and just focus on the Pacific. And then Hitler made that mistake. It was one of the three mistakes from which he never recovered, um, uh, allowing the BEF to escape from Dunkirk, invading the Soviet Union in June of 41, and declaring war on the United States unilaterally. My sense is and this is a biographer wandering into history uh, without, a, without a pass, uh, <laughs> is if he had, <clears throat> you take any one of those mistakes away and the outcome of the war might have been different. He could have made two, but he made three. Uh, John Lukash uh, has made a, a great uh, contribution, I think, uh, by writing these very focused books. Uh, his um, Five Days in London, is the basis really of the Darkest Hour mm -hmm. movie that's out right now. Um, mm -hmm. To go to Margaret's point about uh, not, well, screenwriters sometimes wanting to make uh, characters more interesting, 
the great achievement of that film, uh, which I think was nominated, uh, uh, that's out now, is they had the good sense of getting out of Churchill's way in terms of his language. I haven't, looked, I haven't seen the screenplay, but I bet that 75% of what I heard watching it is actually from his letters, from his speeches, from, uh, from him. And it, a lot of screenwriters tend to want to make it their own. When you're dealing with Churchill, who handled the language as well as anybody since Shakespeare, uh, it's a good idea to, to get out of the way. Just to digress about that for one moment. So there was a conversation the other day about this, and uh, I don't know if Sally Bedell Smith is in the room, but she was talking about one part of it that just didn't happen, and it doesn't matter. But there's a whole part, for those of you who have seen Darkest Hour, you remember the focus group in the underground. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But that never happened. He could never find, he couldn't have found an underground <laughs> if it had, you know. <laughs> If you said that's where all the Johnny Walker Red is, he might have found <laughs> yeah. it. Uh, yeah. But even then, yeah. probably not. Uh, but I think that's, it's a little bit like the Bible. I think that's true, but not accurate. Yeah, I think, yeah. That's, I think she comes out there yeah. too, by the way. Yeah. I, think she, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to get in trouble with any biblical. Uh, yeah. <laughs> let's say that's a point of view. Yeah. Uh, Margaret, anybody, any, anybody you would love to, to write about if you were deciding you want to be a biographer instead of a historian? Um, the trouble, <coughs> yes, there, there are several people, but the trouble is they've already had very good biographies done. I mean, I would love to have written... That's never stopped me or Doug. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, maybe you're right. I may, I may rethink it. No, I've always been fascinated by Eleanor Roosevelt, um, who seems to me a complicated, intelligent, unhappy, and very important person who made a real difference to the United States. But there are one, there's a wonderful biography uh, by Blanche Cook. The tr Blanche trilogy. Cook. Oh, Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah, yeah Eleanor. Uh, did I say, who did I say? You Eleanor. said Roosevelt. Oh, sorry, Eleanor Roosevelt. A trilogy of her. Yes, I, I mean, I do find her a fascinating <coughs> person. Oh. And, and uh, FDR must have been one of the most difficult people to be married to and complicated himself. But I just think she is absolutely fascinating. Um, I wanted to do a biography years ago, someone who most people have never heard of. He wrote a few bad Victorian poems called Wilfred Scorn Blunt, mm -hmm. who was an absolute rogue, had many affairs, traveled around the world, wrote a diary which was published, but his wife cut all the bits out that mm -hmm. she thought. The good parts. Yeah, she cut, well, what we would think is the interesting parts. Um, but nobody knows about him, and I once mentioned it to a publisher, and they said no. <laughs> um, well, they do, they have that way of looking and thinking, you know, you can see them sort of dollar signs or pound signs going through their minds, and they say, no, we just don't think it would sell. Right. And they were absolutely right. So no, I, I don't know if I'll ever dare do a biography. I, I'm slightly apprehensive, because what you do is, is so complicated, and you have to live with the person. That's true. And what someone told me once, a very nice woman I knew who did a biography of Kim Philby's father, the great British spy, had a father who was equally strange, who, <laughs> St. John Philby, who threw up um, being a British citizen and went off to live in Saudi Arabia and worked for the Saudi king in the 1930s. And, and actually, there is a Philby-Saudi family still. If you go to Saudi Arabia, you can meet Fatima Philby and Fawad Philby. And anyway, well, he had a second, whole second life there. And, and this very nice woman called Elizabeth Monroe did a biography of St. John Philby, and she said, I came to hate him so much that it was absolute misery. Yeah. It was so painful to write because I just couldn't bear to spend any more time with him. So choosing a biography is a bit like choosing a, a partner. It is. You know, well, well you know, let me ask this. It's, it's, you have to be careful, I think. It, you know more than me. But you know, uh, I'm curious, what, what Doug and, and John, what you, your experience is, have you ever had the experience that there's somebody who you're writing about, and first of all, you want to find stuff that's totally new, so how do you do that? Mm -hmm. But then secondly, you find something that's totally new that you're not really happy you found. Yeah. But you've got to deal yeah, with it. Yeah, that's interesting. Doug, has that happened yeah. to you? Let's say, um, well, let, let me, per, before, let me just comment on this. I, I do think that, um, you know, for example, it is intimidating to do a president that a lot of good books have been written yeah. on. But yeah. T.J. Styles, one of our, the great biographers, I hope you got know his books and we're at a session of him here at the conference. He's amazing. He's doing a new biography styles on Theodore Roosevelt. Oh, good for there's been wow. so much written wow. on Theodore Roosevelt that yeah. it's easy to be intimidated that yeah. there's not a role for me, but right. you go for yeah. it. I would encourage you to do Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, Blanche Cook has these amazing three volumes, yeah. but there's still a lot of material yeah. and a way to do a very powerful biography of hers. I tend to think of what figures don't have the big biography that need to be done, though. Yeah. With that said, a couple right now that this conference made me think about a few that we still don't have a big biography of. I've done so much presidential history here. Nobody, 
Meacham's on a great topic with James Madison. I'm telling you, that, that's the, uh, the big one to do, and he's got it. But James Monroe, nobody's done. The big mm-hmm. book on James Monroe, our fifth president, he mm-hmm. could have won a third term. He oversaw the era of good feelings, obviously, with John Quincy Adams, the Monroe Doctrine. And, and you know, uh, the, um, it's a lot that can be done with Monroe, and nobody's done a big popular biography of him. In a modern context, I am aghast that there's not a big biography on Cesar Chavez. Hmm. There is Cesar Chavez oh, yeah. Boulevards, <laughs> parks, <coughs> highways, National Monument here in Keene, California, everything, his name, and yet nobody is invested in a life and times of Cesar mm-hmm. Chavez. So those are examples of how you think about sometimes it's about, you know, wow, that's wide open. Yeah. Or forget it, I'll do something that I want to do. I'd love to write on George Washington, but I'm intimidated. There's so yeah. much yeah. I would have to do what I'm doing with space and what Margaret did with China or something, I would take off like George Washington at Valley Forge, yeah. just what is Valley Forge in American memory, a piece of them, because I'm not uh, apt, I'm not so good in the Revolutionary War period, even though I wish I, wish mm. I was. Mm. Can I say something about this stray observation? I'd love to see if, see if you all agree, because Doug's talking about, you know, we sometimes call them slice books or the full meal, you know. Um, yeah. Soup to nut, do you do soup to nuts or do you do um, a, a, a piece of it? I think the biggest threat to what, I don't want to drag you all into my thing, but I, what we do, broadly put, is Netflix. Hmm. <laughs> let, me, let me explain. TV is now so good, it's a case of deregulation working, right? You broke the monopoly. Uh, of the networks and technology it, technology and it turns out that yes there is an enormous amount of talent that need, needed to be unleashed and be, uh, my sense is since I don't write you know I try to write short books but they tend to it's like Bush 41 used to worry about mission creep you know always <laughs> have this mission creep um, but the 20 hours 30, however long it takes people ultimately to read a single book that time is by and large being used watching really good British crime dramas. Mm-hmm. And I hey, Can I just ask, how many of you are watching really good British crime dramas? Wow. And, and, and by the way, Australian, Acorn TV, any of you subscribe to Acorn TV? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. And <coughs> how many of you, this is unfair since you're right here right now, but how many of you find yourself more often talking to friends not about what you're reading, mm-hmm. But what you're watching. Yeah, yeah that's a, that, that's a, yeah, that's a really good point, John. That is definitely happening. Yeah, interesting. And and let me try this out too, since we have a little focus group. How many of you find yourselves listening to books as much as, or maybe more than reading books? Mm. See, that's another phenomenon. Yeah. Yeah. But but let me ask you of the three of you as writers, because you've all had books that are now read and accessible that way. Do you care whether somebody reads your book? Rather than listens to it, I don't. No, no, no. no. My work is done once you pay yeah. for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh. I got children to feed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, there's a funny thing about a book. I mean, Margaret Atwood put it very well once. She said, "I write a book, and it's like a child. I send it out into the world, and what it makes of that world, it's 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 on its own." You know, I've done it, the book, I've sent it out, whatever happens to the book, however it's what received. What a loving mother. Yeah. <laughs> well, she's, she, the she, Jack London maternal instinct. Yeah, well, she's, she takes quite a firm view, but I know what she means. It's done. You can't do anything more with it. And, you know, you do get people, and we all get emails and letters saying, you should have done this, and you should have done that, and, and it's too late. You know, we're right. not going to, the book is done. We're not going to change it. I think right. very few writers go back and rewrite oh. after with, they've published it. With uh, largely in agreement with what they said, but there's still, if I had a choice between somebody bringing me a books on tape to sign or the book, yeah. I'd like to sign the book. Sure. Because uh, mm. I went in, I think, to the book world. Uh, I used to yeah. work as the night manager of Second Story Books in Washington, D.C., and ran used and antiquarian books. And then I worked at Booked Up for Larry McMurtry, a great novelist. I was a book collector. I'd go to a state of sales, and even now, I co- that's my hobby, first editions, book collections, building an Americana library and all. As a bookman, that's what I like. So uh, the books on tape, I understand it. I think I've listened to them sometimes, usually memoirs of people on books mm-hmm. on tape when I commute from Austin to Rice University where I teach. But to me, there's nothing like the tangible book in the hand. Yeah. 
It does make the choice of the narrator hugely important. I think so. Yeah. So yeah. in your contracts, John, do you have, or, or Margaret and Doug, do you have any provision having to do with the choice of a narrator for the book yes. you've written? Yes, I don't. Do you? I don't. So how does, how does your I've contract? I've got to talk to my agent. <laughs> Yeah, so how does well, your we have the same editor, as you know, so yeah. we, we can fix it. So how does your, but how, you know, <laughs> just a little thing. So my, my arrangement at the last book was that, that they would, that I couldn't choose them, but I got to consult. So they actually sent me four possible narrators. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah. And, I, and I listened with a little focus group of uh, students to the four writers, to the four readers, and we all agreed on the one we liked the best. But what's happened? Is that what you think it's? Well, I always wanted. I, I had a I had a dream uh, narrator for the Bush Forty One book. I wanted Sam Waterston to read it. Mm. Oh wow! Because yeah. I thought, you know, let I can let's raise one wasp with another. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, you want Connecticut? I'll give you Connecticut. Uh, and he couldn't do it. Um, I was lucky. Ed Herman uh, oh, yeah. read read one of mine, uh, Jefferson, and then tragically uh, died. Yeah. I mainly, I love Ed, but I also, he did all of McCullough's, so I was trying to get, hope that I was confusing people. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, that was, there was some nice, very nice person at this festival came up and told me how much she loved my book on Truman and, um, and the young Theodore Roosevelt. And I, was like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, you know. This Try happened. being Doug Brinkley and everybody calls you David Brinkley. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear your complaint. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever get, how, what were Sam and Cokie really like? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I'm not lying. My first book was for Yale University Press on Dean Acheson, and a book, somebody I knew in Madison Avenue owned a bookstore. Anyway, they threw a really nice home party for me in their New York penthouse. I was a young kid, my first book, sitting at this desk with my signing pen of Dean Acheson, and lo and behold, in a tuxedo was Walter Cronkite in line. Nice. I thought, wow, yeah. the guy I watched in Ohio's coming to my book signing on yeah. Dean Acheson. And I kept an eye on him while I was talking to other people, you know, until he came up. And when he got up to me, he said, um, that was a, a wonderful time we had sailing together up in he had thought I was David, um, <laughs> I was David's son, and and I was you put in you're always put in that position to yeah. say oh yeah. uh, you know yeah. and I just said mate corrected him a little I watched him just slink out through yeah. the uh, that's you know, good. The, yeah. a, we could do a whole category on this. I was on stage recently with a very prominent person interviewing him, and he kept asking me about said well you know as you wrote about Grant, said well, you know your Hamilton point. Oh, Jesus, Jesus Christ, he thinks I'm Ron Chernow. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, but so how did you handle it? Yeah, I just you... rolled with, you know, I was yeah. like, yes, yes, I, I, I like my rap musical too. Yeah. Well, yeah. Has it, but something like this happens. How many of you have had somebody walk up to an airport or something and they're convinced you're some other person? Yeah. I used to be somebody who nobody pays any attention anymore, which is Phil Donahue. Uh, and I got such great treatment as Phil Donahue. I, nobody but me really cared when his show went off the air, but I did because I stopped getting such good treatment. It's a great Jim, the great Jim Baker story, speaking of great Texans. Uh, Baker ran for attorney general in Texas in 1978, the only time he was on a ballot, and he lost. And he was on his way out to his ranch that Friday after the election to lick his wounds. He's filling up his truck with gas, and an old boy walks up to him and says, Anybody ever tell you you look a lot like Jimmy Baker? <laughs> and guys, and Baker said, yeah, sometimes. He said, doesn't that just piss you off? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, one, we will never be pissed off by this terrific panel. Please join me in thanking these wonderful, wonderful groups. That's a great story.